everyone. Thanks so much for joining our session on privacy messaging that resonates. I am Melanie Ensign. I am the founder and CEO of Discernible Inc. Uh, we are a communications consultancy dedicated specifically to cybersecurity, privacy, and risk issues. Uh, prior to uh, launching this company, I led security, privacy, and engineering communications at Uber. I've worked on security communications at Facebook and at AT&T, uh, and I've also worked with a whole bunch of different clients uh, in my previous uh, life as a consultant as well. Um, so I am so excited uh, to welcome to the discussion today uh, Patience Hagen from The Wall Street Journal. Uh, and before I ask her to, to introduce herself, uh, I want to provide a little bit of background and context for our conversation today. There have been a lot of discussions already at this event about different types of communication and different communication needs. So, you know, we've had uh, experts talking about communicating to the board, communicating to consumers, communicating to regulators, communicating to investors. All of those stakeholders are important uh, for different types of privacy um, efforts, whether you're an in-house privacy professional or running a privacy tech uh, vendor or startup. And so I think the most important thing that I want folks to keep in mind uh, as we jump into the conversation today is that communication is really about earning and exercising influence. We communicate to get other people to to do things, either to influence their behavior, to influence their attitudes. As a organization, there needs to be an objective to your communication activities. Uh, and if you don't have an objective, you're gonna have a really difficult time identifying which audiences and which stakeholders you need to reach in order to actually move the needle or influence behavior um, towards a certain outcome for your organization. And so I'm excited that Patience is here because she represents a really important uh, and common uh, tool that we have in our, in our toolkit as communicators, which is the free press, uh, it, at least in the United States. Uh, media works a little bit differently uh, in other uh, countries, and that certainly uh, influences how we work with them there. Um, but I do want folks to keep in mind that that press is one tactic for certain audiences, for certain objectives. So do not assume that you're gonna reach all of your stakeholders and hit all of your communication objectives solely by seeking press coverage. So with that said, Patience, can I ask you to uh, give the, the group a little bit of a introduction and background on you? Sure, I'm Patience Hagen. I'm a reporter for the Wall Street Journal where I write about digital advertising, privacy and surveillance. Um, and I used to cover startups and venture capital out in San Francisco. Awesome. So I want to start with why communication around privacy is so important and kind of the unique characteristics of it compared to some of the other uh, topics or issues that organizations might need to communicate about either internally um, and externally. So you might have several different goals in mind when you start talking about privacy related topics such as consumer education, business development, maybe you're seeking funding, uh, you might wanna grow a community. I know there's been a lot of mention about Open Mind uh, today. I highly recommend that group as well. Uh, maybe you just wanna engage with other privacy professionals or other privacy teams because you want to share experiences. You wanna talk about challenges and opportunities and actually engage in some knowledge sharing. All of these goals could be worthwhile depending on the needs of your organization. But you need to actually know how to reverse engineer your strategy and your tactics from those results that you're seeking. And like I said, press may not be may not always be the, the right channel for you. Uh, the Wall Street Journal may not always be the right channel for you. Um, but you know it's it's important to understand where it is you're trying to go um, so that you can build the the strategy um, and the narrative to help get you there. And so the details may be different depending on your goals. And that's why it's so important that you know clearly what your business goals are before you start attempting to do uh, a communications program. Otherwise, you could very well um, be swimming in all different directions against current and not really make any progress. 
So Patience, let me ask you a little bit about your thoughts um, from a press perspective on how do you recognize what an organization's goals are when they reach out to you, you know, as, as a privacy company or a, a tech company or other type of company that is hoping to get you to pay attention to their privacy efforts? Oh, well, I'd say uh, sometimes I can tell right away. So sometimes, you know, when companies have business development as their goal, that's usually very obvious to reporter. Um, we can tell we can tell when they're just talking up their capabilities to attract more funding or more business because they they honestly tend to use whatever buzzwords are popular among techies and venture capitalists that week. And then, you know, by contrast, when companies have consumer education in mind, that's when the messaging gets more varied and more interesting and hopefully more edifying. Um, some companies do this really well by having a really good meet on cons read on consumers' current level of understanding. Um, and if they if they have a good read on consumers' kind of specific concerns, then they I can tell from their messaging that they're really anticipating the consumers' questions in the right way. Yeah, there was uh, a session earlier today, and I apologize that I don't remember exactly who it was that that mentioned this. But the the fact that you know privacy is really a full stack issue. It's it's not a policy. Um, and so your ability as a company to actually show privacy in action, um, whether it's for the consumer audience, like you talked about, um, which is certainly a part of the, the Wall Street Journal uh, readership, but also, you know, a lot of privacy tech companies are, they're B2B and their, uh, their target audience may be uh, a CPO or general counsel or an engineering VP uh, and understand where exactly they're getting their information and what kind of information influences them is also part of it as well. And being able to demonstrate privacy uh, in a language and in a manner that makes, makes sense to them. Um, I was recently talking to um, a CISO uh, and was asking them just kind of various questions about where they get information uh, what kind of information they trust and the in sources and things like that. And it was interesting The CISO told me that, you know, truly they get their information about kind of what's up and coming uh, in more of like an engineering and, and technical space by the tweets of one person. There is one person who they trust immensely in the community and they follow that person to know what the latest and greatest is in terms of privacy engineering. And that may seem strange to a lot of people, but it made a lot of sense to me given how much noise there is, how much marketing speak there is, and knowing the relationship that these two people have, um, and knowing that you know if, if this person is recommending a certain approach or a certain technology, a lot of people are actually going to look into that um, and at least consider it for their team, uh, even if they don't end up adopting that approach or, or that solution themselves. And so I want to shift a little bit in terms of the role of media within a broader communications plan. You know, as you mentioned, patients, it's it's not just about the the message of the moment, right? You talked about the the buzzwords and how it's so easy to tell when your your comms person does not know what what they're actually talking about, and so they're a little bit dependent on some of that heavy jargon. But one of the other things that we struggle with um, as a communications profession, and I know that privacy and legal share the same pain is our metrics are not great in terms of how we prove value to the business. And as a result, we've kind of defaulted on these somewhat superficial uh, metrics in terms of, you know, did you get press coverage? Did you get mentioned in an article? Now, not every article is worth being in. Not every publication is worth being in. Again, it really depends on what your objectives are and uh, who your stakeholders are. And one example that I'll share pretty quickly is several years ago, uh, I was working with an organization that had previously experienced just a number of uh, very public and expensive uh, like privacy snafus right now. If you look me up on LinkedIn, you're really not going to be able to tell which company it was because they've all <laughs> they have all uh, gone through that, uh, that those growing pains. But this particular company was at a point where they had truly made some pretty significant advancements in their privacy investments and in their privacy posture. And they wanted to at least communicate that they were starting to turn the corner um, and that things were getting better. Um, there were new people in charge of this particular effort. There were genuine reasons for people to put a little bit more trust uh, in what this company was doing. However, the, the PR team got really kind of obsessed with landing a story in a mainstream, a particular mainstream uh, 
uh, media outlet. In fact, it was a, it was an outlet whose editorial team wasn't just well known for this, but was in fact well respected for beating up on the executives of this industry. It, but the PR team was so narrowly focused on landing a story in this outlet that what they ended up with was an executive profile in this publication portrayed this particular well-respected professional as, you know, somebody who had been who had been brought in to clean up the mess, right? And how hard it was going to be for that person to to accomplish that goal. And so this article that was intended to signal to consumers and to regulators that the company was starting to turn the page and had learned their lesson from past mistakes ended up just being a very, very lengthy and detailed reminder of all of the things they had done wrong and how hard it was gonna be to clean it up. Now, the PR team claimed it a success because they got coverage, uh, but the negative impact that that <laughs> news cycle had on their reputation uh, and the, the trust in their brand, um, you know, there was a disconnect. You know, the, the, the strategy and the tactics that they followed didn't actually meet their objectives. Um, and so, you know, this is just another reason why it's so important to understand exactly what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, because, you know, this poor team wasted so much time, not just the PR team's time, but the executive's time. Um, and it, it soured a really important media relationship for them as well. Um, so patients, I, I now want to ask you, um, you know, from, from a journalist perspective, one of the things that I hear all the time uh, when reporters are looking for sources is they need somebody who's credible, right? They're not just going to ask anybody under the sun to comment on any which thing. So, you know, when, when you're thinking about developing a story or when people reach out to you with story ideas, how do you kind of think through whether or not they're a credible source and how would you recommend people start to develop that credibility? Okay, what a great question. I'd say, um, I'd say that when I look for experts, they they really need to come for a place of of deep knowledge to be taken seriously as experts. But they also need to, they also need to um, strike the delicate balance of explaining those technological aspects well enough to demonstrate their subject matter expertise, while also uh, being able to explain them in plain language for news consumers and. Usually that means being able to focus on the tangible consequences for those consumers. So uh, one an example that comes to mind of a great privacy expert is Ashkan Soltani, who uh, used to be chief technologist of the FTC. He and I, I consider him probably one of the world's leading, leading experts on ad tracking technology. Uh, and I found that he's exceptionally good at breaking tech down for journalists and for lay audiences. Yeah, it's a great example. And, you know, other folks that I've seen with similar capabilities in terms of being able to break down, you know, complex uh, technologies or concepts is also the fact that they they look at that whole stack. Right. And they're actually able to demonstrate that they represent the full 360 environment in which they're working. Right. It is never just engineering. It is never just legal. It is never just user experience. Uh, but to really understand the pain points of your end users, your internal teams, um, as well as your, you know, your other stakeholders. Like, I mean, we make fun of regulators and policymakers all the time, and, and they have earned that. But, but they're most of them are well intentioned, um, and you need to understand how they do their job and what their pain points are. And so, it's one of the things that that we coach spokespeople to think about is what are the things that you that your audience actually needs to hear you say. Um, in order for you to be credible to them. Um, because you just talking about yourself, talking about your product does not ingratiate trust um, on behalf of the, the people that you need to convince you actually understand um, the problems and challenges that they have, as well as the opportunities that they seek, right? We, we talk a lot, uh, we've even seen some of it today where you know, privacy is an opportunity um, from a business perspective, and there is a tremendous opportunity for privacy professionals to really position themselves as general business advisors um, and help their organizations make um, broader, more impactful decisions rather than simply being the janitor who has to, you know, clean up all, all of the privacy debt. Uh, and so I, I want to shift now just a little bit, uh, patients still touching on this topic of credibility. Um, but driving a little bit more in terms of narratives, 
Um, what are the types of narratives that you have seen coming from organizations that are building credibility uh, in their privacy commitments? And what are the types of narratives that, that are perhaps working against that objective? All right, I'd say um, as for narratives that do build credibility, one that uh, one that usually strikes a pretty good chord is giving the consumer control. You know, when companies uh, at least say they're giving you full control over who's getting your data, when, and letting you revoke that data, that access, that creates at least the appearance of you know handling your data responsibly. Of course, you know, there's always the question of whether those controls really work the way that companies represent them. And that's, you know, that's still another matter for, you know, muckbreaking journalists to look into. Another narrative that I'd say does effectively build credibility is launching something like privacy nutrition labels, kind of like what Apple has done. That idea actually came out of Carnegie Mellon's Scilab. Uh, that lab recommended privacy nutrition labels as a way to make privacy policy is easier to understand and compare. As for narratives that don't build credibility, I'd say um, the most common one would be just being vague or unprepared on when talking about privacy. When a company seems blindsided by very simple questions, uh, like just asking what data they collect or how long they keep it, that's a red flag that they're not making privacy a priority. And another, um, one particular area where I feel like companies are so often vague is their data sharing practices. You know, companies often say, we share your data with our partners and they give no further detail about who those partners are. And, you know, that doesn't build trust at all. Just about any company they do business with could be a partner. So they can be sharing it with, you know, everyone in the world. Yeah. I mean, th those are really good examples, particularly for folks that are, you know, um, you know, working in-house at, at an organization and really trying to demonstrate that um, that they're taking privacy seriously. Uh, some of the conversations that I have with uh, with privacy tech startups, in particular, um, often um, leads to a little bit of confusion about what are the different types of narratives um, that a company can even have. Right? You can have different narratives simultaneously. Um, again, it depends on who your audience is and what your objectives are. So just a few like simple examples um, that are pretty common in, in the startup world is you have, you know, funding announcements or, or news about, you know, investments. Um, truthfully, not the most uh, influential uh, from a buyer's perspective, depending on who your buyer is, right? Um, it does signal to investors um, that, that you are a serious player in the market. Um, it does signal to senior executives that your company isn't going to go out of business in six months after they sign a contract. Um, you know, so, so it does have have some impact with certain stakeholders. Um, but, it, you know, if your end user is uh, privacy engineers, um, they're really not following uh, funding news, um, you know, at a broad level. Obviously, we have uh, some angel investors and advisors who do. Um, but that is, is still the exception today. So keeping in mind, you know, what funding news is actually going to be able to do for you from like a lead generation perspective. Uh, the second type is thought leadership. Uh, and these are a little bit more evergreen, but can be tied to current events. Uh, and as a former um, manager once told me that in order to be a thought leader, you have to have a thought. So being unique, being compelling, being provocative, uh, these are all things that are actually required to position uh, your organization as leading um, in privacy. Uh, and I think one of the biggest missed opportunities that we have in privacy tech is everybody's just talking about how they help you become compliant. That's kind of a bare minimum. If your privacy tech company isn't reaching some kind of regulatory uh, you know, baseline, uh, you're, you're going to have a hard time signing that contract to begin with. Um, but if you're really trying to position your company as leading the market, you have got to be doing and saying things that other people are not. And I think that's where folks struggle uh, in finding their voice for their organization is, you know, what is your thought that you can actually share uh, to demonstrate leadership? And the third type of narrative is product um, or technical capabilities. Uh, and again, that is a narrative that is, you know, usually more impactful with a very specific audience and through very specific channels. Um, a lot of the most influential 
product advice and sharing of information and kind of where people are getting recommendations on products, they're happening in Slack channels, they're happening on Discord, uh, they're happening in, in group signal chats. Um, they're not necessarily happening through through press coverage. Um, so keeping in mind, you know, again, this is all about influence. Who are the nodes that you can poke and what are the, the levers that you need to pull to actually influence the right people in the direction that you want them to go? Right, right, absolutely. I'd say like one thing that I've seen companies do um, just in the past year is introduce all these new transparency features, partly in response to the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and one thing that really strikes me about these is that so many of them just shower you with so much information um, that it actually doesn't make anything more transparent. You know, under um, CCPA, consumers have the right to know what data a company has on them. So in response to that requirement, you know, the biggest social media companies created these portals where consumers can download, like, download your data. But it, what it gives you is like a staggering amount of data, but it still doesn't tell you anything about the company's data practices. These like these enormous downloads, they just give you all your posts, comments and likes. Uh, that kind of thing. When it comes to data they've collected through partners, like, um, you know, anyone who's providing them data or, for instance, every website you've ever visited that has their tracking code on it, you know, of that data, their companies, they, if they give you anything, they only give you vague categories by your interests. It, and this, the fact that they're providing it this way really obscures the fact that they actually know every site you've ever visited. And these data downloads, right, they actually create the impression that the only data those companies have on you is the raw data you've provided, which is definitely not true. So, you know, the law, like it, for another thing, it requires companies to provide you data on what they've inferred about you from everything you've done. Uh, but these companies did not do so almost without exception. You know, social media companies make so many conclusions about you from every click you make and from every interaction you make with another user, but their down, data download to, tools just gave back raw data that you provided on yourself. It didn't tell us anything about what they'd inferred. So that like that kind of messaging, I mean, it drives a reporter crazy, but it also just leaves open a lot more questions than it answers. So it's like, you know, if you make a transparency tool that like, that just gives me a lot of information, but no, um, no actual like new information of substance, reporters are going to see through that right away. And you're just going to have a lot, lot more questions coming. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, to your point about just kind of the, the efforts to be transparent yet not leading to better privacy. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of the things that, that we're seeing develop is this, this concept of privacy washing, right? Where if, if you're familiar with greenwashing in the sustainability space, this is a similar topic or a similar concept where, um, you know, the, the overuse and the misuse of the terminology actually dilutes the meaning of it um, and kind of allows anybody to throw a privacy sticker on anything they want and, and claim it as privacy. Um, and one of the challenges that, that we have seen in terms of, you know, corporate narratives around privacy is that they really are trying to convince um, a number of stakeholders um, that merely showing you all of the terrible things that they're doing with their data um, equals privacy. Um, and it doesn't. Um, obviously, there are uh, specific requirements like under GDPR where the data has to be provided in a computer readable format. Um, but the law doesn't say that that's all you can provide, right? So, we, you know, there's a lot of conversation about the somewhat uselessness um, from a consumer education perspective of these really long privacy policies. And I get it. Like, I, I've worked with so many people who've had to write those policies. Um, the people writing them don't want to be writing them. They are legally required, um, but they are a terrible communication format. Um, and so similarly, we've got these really long privacy policies that nobody is reading. We've got, you know, computer readable data sets that humans can't understand. Uh, and there is nothing saying that companies have to stop there, right? Uh, and this is where, you know, we talk about the fact that meeting the legal minimum does not get you any brownie points. You do not get trust and reputation increases by just operating legally, right? 
Uh, and so there, there are more opportunities um, to demonstrate privacy and make it really clear that you are not a privacy washing organization. Because at the end of the day, privacy is about protecting people. Um, there was a session earlier today where, you know, somebody was really, and I think correctly explaining that it's not just about data. We're not really trying to protect data. We're trying to protect people. And the data ties um, to people and has an impact on their, their civil liberties and their freedoms. And so, you know, allowing, allowing yourself or allowing other organizations to slide into this kind of lazy mode of communication um, you know, just putting privacy stickers on things uh, is, is really bad for everybody and is counterproductive to what we're trying to do as a profession. Um, and so, you know, these somewhat misleading or inaccurate um, kind of statements that we make either as in-house professionals or, or from a vendor, it's really important that we're holding ourselves to a high standard of um, accuracy as well as intellectual honesty about what we are calling privacy and about what we are conditioning other people to accept as privacy. Um, and so one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you, it's one of my favorite questions to, to ask journalists, is what is your process for validating privacy claims? How do you kick the tires um, and make sure that the emperor is actually wearing clothes? And I mixed a lot of metaphors uh, in one sentence. So enjoy that. Well, I when I hear companies make certain claims about their privacy, I and my colleagues at the Wall Street Journal look for ways to technically test that their practices really match what they're claiming. So for instance, sometimes that's uh, intercepting an app's traffic to make sure the app is really collecting only the data that the company says it's collecting. Um, or making sure that it really stops collecting data once a user's opted out. Or um, sometimes it's about the precision of the data they're sending. Like they're, uh, you know, they might disclose that they're sending location data. And it, it actually gets a lot more interesting if you can see exactly how precise that location data is. Like they know exactly what street corner you're on. We, so we always look for ways to technically test it out and like, you know, really put them through their paces. Great. Um, I want to go through a couple of um, red flags, um, just from the internal perspective as well as um, from a press perspective, uh, and then we'll move into audience questions. So if there's anything specific um, that you want us to address, please uh, add those to the, the chat on, on the side. I apologize if you've already asked a question, but the thread is so long, I'm never going to be able to read it. So if you want your question answered, please retype it. Um, in the next couple of minutes, because uh, I'm just not going to be able to scroll through uh, all, all of the, the chats from this session. So in terms of red flags, these are things as, as an internal communications professional that I'm looking for with developers and product teams where I'm like, I know that that's going to get flagged as uh, like privacy washing or, or bullshit uh, when we try to launch this or when we try to you know, convince customers that, that this is privacy. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is most important is having some really strong ethical and scientific rigor around product research and methodology. Um, the most controversial product I ever had to advise was built um, by a product team based on the feedback of 11 people. They talked to 11 users and you know, uh, used that as justification for building something that was incredibly privacy invasive and caused a huge backlash for, for the company and was something that they weren't even actually able to roll out globally because of all the legal implications. So having really sound product research and methodology is really, really important. I actually wish that that was something that reporters would ask more companies to provide um, is the data and the evidence that led to certain product decisions. Um, none of that should be proprietary when it comes to, you know, uh, saying that this is something that your users want or need um, or, uh, you know, that they can actually use it in a certain way. Um, I don't believe that that should be considered something that is secretive to the company um, because it is it is, in fact, the justification for how you make decisions and how you um, think about the, the different uh, trade offs and factors. Um, that go into these decisions. Um, the, the keynote presentation this morning touched on this as well when she said it's, you know, it's a positive sum game. You know, 
uh, you get privacy and something else. So instead of saying you get privacy or safety, you should get privacy and safety. But how you actually find that balance you need to be able to explain that to people. And you you can't do that honestly if you haven't done your homework um, already from a, a research and methodology perspective. The second thing that I recommend um, folks think about is it, particularly if you're building a privacy product um, or product that has privacy implications, build your MVP for your harshest critics. Because whether you like it or not, and whether you are a household brand or not, the first users of your product will be activists, litigators, and journalists. So anything that is wrong or incomplete or simply not functional in your product will first be discovered by the people you definitely don't want to know that you shipped something that wasn't finished or didn't work. Um, so MVP products in the privacy space do not get uh, benefit of the doubt uh, and kind of the uh, relaxed um, expectation that all software has bugs. Um, we've got to build our MVP, MVP products with our harshest critics in mind. And so for, from your perspective, patients, what are some of the, the big red flags um, that, that you see from a press perspective? I'd say vagueness is probably the most common red flag. So for instance, I've encountered companies that, you know, when asked about their privacy, they just say, we comply with the law. Well, they don't even say which law. And the U.S. doesn't have much in the way of privacy law. So it's a very low bar to simply say you comply with the law. That tells that tells me nothing. Uh, and it, it probably means their practices uh, there, you know, just aren't very much. Another red flag is when a company brags that their data is anonymized. Uh, I mean, by now, it's it's old canard. I think well-informed readers are aware that it's very easy to re-identify data that's been anonymized. So we know that that doesn't really protect us. Yeah, exactly. So I want to end on a, on a really quick kind of positive note uh, before we jump into the audience questions. What is... You know, do you have a, a piece of advice um, or some wisdom for, for the group on, on how an organization can can effectively tell a, a compelling story about privacy? Sure, sure. I, I'd say privacy is a really tough subject um, to communicate. Um, for one um, little offbeat example, I recently came across an innovative children's book that tackled it. It's The Eye Monger by Professor Daniel Solov, who's speaking as part of this event, as you might know. Um, his children's book tells the story of a monster with 103 eyes who surveils everyone in a town until that constant surveillance stifles the townspeople's creativity. That, uh, I, I just wanted to call it out because it's a compelling story about privacy that really knew its audience. And it's an example of how to communicate about privacy with your audience in mind, even if that audience is kids. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great example. I know uh, Professor Salu's book has been getting a lot of accolades, um, at least in, in my uh, privacy social circle. So I'm going to switch over to um, audience questions. We've got about uh, 10 minutes for audience questions. Um, the first one I see is from Caroline asking, um, how as a startup do you communicate it? So for example, at ClearOps, I really wanted to build in controls for users to delete their data whenever they wanted to but I don't think that is super interesting to outsiders. So I think that there's a couple of things that stand out to me here is one, is the value of building those controls dependent on other people thinking it, it's valuable? Um, do you need outsiders to actually recognize the value of that in order for, for you to, to implement it? If so, um, one of the things to think about is if, if you are a security company and you are a data or a privacy company, you have to eat your own dog food. You know, I see so many privacy tech companies whose business practices are somewhat abysmal from a privacy perspective. You know, one of the one of the companies that that I do uh, consult with had a need to transfer large volumes of consumer data on behalf of of their customers, but they're a privacy company. They're like, we don't want to have anything to do with user data, so they actually had to build and then they open sourced their own end-to-end -end encryption protocol for streaming in a browser so that they can facilitate these large data transfers without ever seeing user data and without having access to it. And so if you are in fact a privacy tech company, you need to be demonstrating that you yourself are taking the steps to be as privacy forward as you can be as a business. 
And then you have the added benefit of it could be interesting to outsiders. It does build trust for them to know that you really live the principles, that you you aren't just selling them privacy because it's a business opportunity, but because it's something you believe in. Uh, I think one of the things that a lot of buyers are looking for, particularly in these areas of security and privacy, which is really just about risk tolerance, uh, risk reduction, but there's never zero risk, is you know we want partners and we want vendors who are gonna hold our hand through every experience. And so if I can trust that you are doing everything you can do um, to respect privacy um, and to respect security, that, that uh, increases my confidence that you're the kind of partner and you're the kind of vendor that I wanna have in the trenches with me when shit hits the fan. It is really difficult to, to build that kind of trust if you are not going above and beyond you know, the, those bare minimum expectations. So this is a, a question, uh, Patience for You, from Michelle. How do your readers get excited about privacy tools and innovations? Ooh, what a great question. How do they get excited? Let's see. I think stories that have some kind of like news you can use angle are some of the ones that do best on that front. Like something, you know, something that kind of makes them feel like they can implement something right away. Like, you know, download your data from this company or, um, you know, you know, follow these steps to make sure you're protected online. I mean, other than that, just speaking generally, I think there's been so much more interest from readers in those topics over the past years. So like, this is a great time to be putting that messaging out there. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, when I started working in security and privacy, there were, I could count on one hand, the number of reporters who actually had either of those topics in their like regular beat assignment, right? Most of them only cared about security or privacy when it tied to the specific company they were actually responsible for covering. So I do think the fact that there are so many more reporters covering these topics and, and people like you at the Wall Street Journal, whose you know, primary responsibility you know, includes privacy, that really speaks to the growing interest from readers, you know, who are consumers. And, you know, because even if we're talking about enterprise customers, they're also consumers. So I, I always view the, the growing uh, press pool um, as, as a positive uh, trend in, in the right direction in terms of whether or not people actually care about this. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time.